Then there was the development of the Saurer theory, and you learned about that this morning. Subtalar axis location and rotational equilibrium theory. As, as Kevin pointed out, rotational equilibrium is a Newtonian certainty. That's not what makes that really his theory. What makes it his theory is subtalar axis location. Once again, this theory is a singular axis theory that uses the same axis that Root, Orion, and Weed used, the subtalar axis. And you're going to see why this is so interesting. Once again, you hang the foot out in space and, and take a three-dimensional cast, which is good. And then you drop the shadow of that axis into the transverse plane. You map it out on the bottom of the foot and concern yourself, as we saw, with which side of the axis kinetic forces are distributed in order to balance around the subtalar joint axis, right? I, I pulled this one out, which shows the, the uh, medial, normal, and laterally deviated axis. This one doesn't seem to pass through the subtalar joint. It kind of create turns the foot into this two-dimensional seesaw, if you will. In the seesaw, when you drop the subtalar axis into the transverse plane, it becomes primarily a frontal plane axis. Hence, we're seeing the, the rotation occurring in the frontal plane. And we're concerned about which side of the axis the ground reaction forces are being applied. My question is, what about the forefoot? What about the rest of the foot? In other words, so I looked it up in the, in the article that you all got, and it said, during many weight-bearing motions, the foot may approximate a relatively rigid unit, with all the bones of the foot rotating around a central pivot of the talus at the subtalar joint axis. Well, it turns out that's been investigated by Nestor and Wolf and Stakoff, and he says a rigid, a rigid functional unit comprised the navicular and cuboid. No other functional units were identified. What I'm saying is you cannot ignore all the other axes and all of the motion that will occur in the forefoot. It's not a rigid functional unit. Data does not support the rigid body assumption. So what posture would you then want to put the foot in? And I had a very hard time finding that because it's really not mentioned, except in one place I found it. I believe that as long as the patient stands in relaxed bipedal stance in a position that's not maximally pronated at the subtalar joint and is at least two to four degrees supinated from the maximally pronated position, they have a potential to have optimal gait function. So that's pretty low in the arch. Now the medial heel skive is an interesting modification. It's a frontal plane rear foot post that occurs inside the heel cup. What does it mean when you put the post inside the heel cup? What it means is it has no effect at all on the height of the medial longitudinal arch. It, in essence, avoids any postural change in the foot, this particular modification. But the foot does go through this huge postural change. The question is, is it really uniaxial? And I'm talking but not just about Salra, but about neutral position theory. Well, neutral, we know. It's a neutral is a rotational position around a singular axis. Is Salra singular axis? Well, it is the subtalar axis location and rotational equilibrium theory. It is about this particular axis. In this article, Emerging Concepts in Podiatric Biomechanics, Dr. Kirby writes, Kirby proposed that the spatial location of the subtalar axis had a significant mechanical effect on the function of the foot 
since its abnormal spatial location relative to the planet our foot significantly alters the magnitudes and direction of rotational forces or moments acting across the subtalar joint axis. I'm just trying to establish here this is indeed we're talking about one axis. Now I want to investigate that axis because this is what's interesting. And this is what blew me away at the, at, when I started looking at the Smithsonian. Firstly, how much motion really occurs around the subtalar joint axis in the ideal gait cycle during stance? Let's take a look right out of Root's book. Plus two, minus four. That's a total motion of what? Six degrees. What was the error in palpation? Plus or minus three degrees. You could be anywhere, literally anywhere, within that six degree motion. By the way, I wanted to make clear what six degrees is. That's six degrees. What does it look like? It looks like this. In three-dimensional animation, we actually took the talus and the calcaneus and moved it precisely six degrees. Let me see, in case you missed it, let me do that again. Here's the motion we're talking about. You see how much motion that is? That is an infinitesimal amount of motion around the subtalar joint axis. What's really interesting was when we went to the Smithsonian, we took 209 cal calcaneuses and taluses, and we put them on top of each other and moved them. And we looked at what the six degree was. And this one, we're actually moving a little more, a lot more than six degrees. But you see, it's not very much motion totally even allowed at the subtalar joint axis. This one here looks like it doesn't have hardly any motion at the subtalar axis. And this is a gorilla foot. And the reason I bring this up is I spent a, a couple of uh, good hours with this guy, Dr. Matt Tocheri, and he is probably the foremost expert in the world on primate hands and feet. He, is, he studies just primate hands and feet. And I said, how important is the subtalar axis in other primates? And he said, not very. It doesn't move very much at all. But this has been measured. Let's take a look at the relative motions of the tibia talus calcaneus during the stance phase of gait. This is Hamill's study. And this really freaked me out. This was, this was an eye-opener for me. They took this, this apparatus screwed to the bones in a cadaver. This is just the bones, but they, this was in a full cadaver that they hooked up and had go through a gait cycle. Well, you know how they, they do all that fancy pulling on the muscles. And this was to magnify the motion so you could actually s somehow see it. Firstly, frontal plane motion between the talus and calcaneus. That's this. There's almost none. Frontal plane motion between the talus and calcaneus hardly exists at all. Isn't that interesting? What was more interesting to me was when the motion occurred. They showed that from 25 to 90% of gait, the subtalar joint axis doesn't move. Whoa, it doesn't move. That's an eye opener. It only moves in the first 25%. In fact, if you look at the stance phase of gait, it's moving. This is the 25 to 90% of motion it doesn't move. When does it move? From 0 to 24%. That's before all of your subtalar joint motion has occurred before flat foot. Wow. It's all done before you even get the forefoot to the ground. Doesn't that blow your mind? <laughs> so the subtalar joint is not in a one-to-one -one relationship with pronation and supination of the foot. Not at all. 
When does it move? In the first 24%, when does it move its six degrees, its little tiny motion? When the foot is in supination, when the anterior facet is level so that the, ant the tailor head can move over the top of it. That little six degree motion is all you get and it only occurs in supination. That tells you what its function is. The function of the subtalar joint is a lock and unlock. That's all. A lock and unlock in the sagittal plane, blocking sagittal plane motion between these two bones. Just like I said this morning, when you pull up on the gastroc, because these two bones can't rotate, you rotate around the ankle axis. Is it important? Yes. Yes. That six degrees locking and unlocking is very important. But how, where do you have to be to get it? You have to be in supination. Very interesting stuff. I was blown away by some of this stuff. What was really fascinating is when you grab these bones, and, and these are these foam bones, but when we grab the bones at the Smithsonian, they almost tell you where to go. You apply a light pressure and they move. They actually slide forward as much or more than they even rotate. There's that little six degree motion and a forward slide. But what they lack in rotation, they more than make up in translation. They more than make up rolling forward. And I stuck a feather in the subtalar axis so you could see it rolling forward. So really, pronation and supination primarily occur around a different axis. In fact, they occur around all the axes together. Not any singular axis, but if you asked me, as, as Doc Dockery says in his lectures, if you put my finger on the chopping block and ask me what's the most important axis, I would say the heel rocker axis. Now, Dr. Perry called that, and then, by the way, in the seven theorems of foot compensation, they talk about it right here in theorem one. Purchase during the contact period of stance phase, the heel strikes the ground in a forward rolling direction. That was John Weed in 1989. And I believe Dr. Horsley was there too, which is, which is really, this is, this is how far ahead of his time John Weed was. Jack Perry called it the heel rocker mechanism. The brilliance of her discovery is that the heel is round. What does that mean? It means that the calcaneus can roll in any direction. Any way you hit the ground, this round heel will answer with an infinite number of axes, going forward or backward. That's an ingenious design. I didn't design it, but it's absolutely brilliant. Let's take a look at a gait cycle in slow motion. We took our high-speed camera, and let's see if we can somehow quantify for this particular flat foot how much translation is actually occurring. If we look at heel strike and we apply the, approximate the subtalar axis, put in a big protractor, and then look at the flattest posture of the foot and look at where the subtalar axis is, it's translating about 33 degrees. About. It's not an exact measurement. Translates 33, rotates 6. Wow, that's an eye-opener. So what's the function? It's that locking and unlocking. It locks when it moves over the anterior facet. It unlocks as it rotates in. It's a locking mechanism that occurs in supination to block sagittal plane motion. 